Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Appreciate you taking time on this beautiful day to come out and to uh, join us for uh, Dr. Fearon's uh, talk, uh, Creating the Future of Cancer Prevention, Cures, and Care Through Discovery. I think all of you know Eric uh, very, very briefly. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate medical school and PhD program at Johns Hopkins, uh, was in Bert Vogelstein's lab, subsequently did uh, postdoc work, and has uh, spent the majority of his career here at the University of Michigan. Uh, Eric has been a leader in the Cancer Center for many years uh, and brings a perspective uh, to this presentation that really encompasses his time uh, as a leader in the Cancer Center, as a leader in cancer nationally and internationally. So it gives me great pleasure at this time uh, to welcome Dr. Eric Fearon. Well, first of all, thanks very much to all of you for attending, and thank you, Dean Willis-Croft, for the kind invitation to speak to you today. So uh, I would say it's with great trepidation that one uh, talks at their home institution because uh, you have so many friends and colleagues, but you, you don't want to let anybody down. So uh, I have done my best to try and be quite broad and comprehensive in uh, my views on cancer uh, biology and, and cancer care. I'll, I'll review some concepts that for some of you may seem a little basic, but I, I think they're useful to bear in mind because I think uh, some of the statistics bear uh, some significance for the challenges still uh, remaining in the cancer field. Oops, one slide too far. That ruined my joke slide. I hope you didn't read that. <laughs> so uh, my presentation outline is to, to spend maybe about 10 minutes at the most talking about uh, cancer, the significance, progress, and challenges I think that remain for the cancer field and for cancer care. I want to give a high level view of NCI cancer centers and academic cancer centers, talk about the current state of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center and the cancer programs at the University of Michigan, which I think are extremely robust, tell you about some of my excitement about opportunities and some of my trepidation about the challenges in cancer research and cancer care, and give some sense of the future directions through some of those that I highlight, as well as some wrap-up slides for future directions for our cancer program in the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center, and then take some questions. So as I was uh, thinking about things to say, I thought, well, Eric, it's really not that important to talk. It's really not life or death or anything like that. But I, I figured it fell into this category. <laughs> um, so uh, the good news is far, I haven't read all of the rules about tenure, but I, I guess it's perhaps not career-ending. Uh, so, uh, again, with that, that um, sort of lighter note in, in mind, I think all of us are familiar with the extreme uh, risks still in, the, in this country and around uh, the industrialized world and much of the world in general for cancer. Uh, upwards of 50% of men in this country and a third of women will develop cancer during their lifetime. What's illustrated in this slide from the CDC uh, is, in fact, the uh, data to support the view that Michigan is a high cancer incident state. My pointer may not be working exactly, but oh, there we go. So Michigan's a quite high incident state. It's in the upper uh, 10 states or so for cancer incidence. So cancer is a major problem in Michigan. And not only does cancer have high incidence in Michigan, cancer is associated with poor outcomes in our state for all of the cancers illustrated here and for many other common uh, malignancies. So Michigan not only suffers from high cancer incidence, but poor outcome. Uh, there's been e enormous improvements in survival over the past three decades or so, familiar to almost everyone in this room, and that's what's highlighted on this slide from the American Cancer Society. And I think that's one of the, the great advances in, in cancer care is, is broad uh, and significant advances in cancer outcomes for the majority, and in fact, many of cancers. But there's clearly still much to do with uh, cancers such as pancreas cancer, illustrated here. Uh, lung and bronchus cancer and leukemia outcomes and, and others there, uh, still not what we'd like them to be. One of the other trends, obviously, that there are substantial differences in cancer survival rates by race, and that's what's illustrated on this slide, and that's important uh, across the country and certainly for the state of Michigan. And just to highlight a few of these, uh, cancers of the uterus, cancers uh, in, in the breast, uh, and oral cavity, particularly marked differences uh, in race between white and African-American uh, patients. 
The impact of cancer, the economic impact, very familiar to many of you, but it's worth highlighting here because it's large and growing. Uh, not only is the direct medical cost implications of roughly $90 billion in 2009 data, uh, but a but rough, rough cost estimated of $130 billion of indirect costs due to mortality. Uh, and these projected medical care costs alone are growing dramatically uh, with a very substantial increase between 9 and 10 and predictions of very significant increases uh, depending on assumptions made about uh, growth of costs in cancer care. One of the, the great news uh, parts of the, the story in the cancer area is the increased and improved survival for many patients with cancer. What's illustrated here, not visible to those in the back, is roughly uh, 14 million or so cancer, patient, can, cancer patients surviving uh, as of January 2014. Uh, the, the estimate over the next decade is this will grow to about 19 million cancer survivors, which is really uh, an enormous improvement. But one of the areas of attention that I think has been highlighted by recent work from our institution and others is the very significant work that needs to be done to understand the impact of cancer and chemotherapy on survival and outcomes in cancer survivors and their families. So this is a paper uh, from Reshma Jagzi, uh, Sarah Hawley, Stephen Katz, and others here at the University of Michi Michigan, Jennifer Griggs. Uh, Reshma actually has had quite a productive spring on her sabbatical, I guess. Uh, she's actually had numerous really high-impact papers, another paper in the JCO on cancer uh, outcomes as well. And what was highlighted in this paper, I won't ask you to read it, uh, or the abstract, is that roughly 30% of those breast cancer patients who were treated for early-stage breast cancer previously working were not working at the four-year follow-up, and 30% of those not working were actively seeking work. And she found in this paper, she and her colleagues, that adjuvant chemotherapy was associated with unemployment, just highlighting one of the many uh, effects on cancer survivors of, of cancer care and cancer uh, diagnoses. So to attack this problem over the past three decades or so, there's been a strong emphasis from the National Cancer Institute on supporting uh, NCI centers where there's a designation associated with them. And these are the states that, in fact, have our homes to NCI designated cancer centers illustrated here many of the states in the country. Michigan's fortunate enough to have two NCI designated centers. They're both designated as comprehensive centers based on the breadth and depth of their research across the, the research continuum, as well as for their activities in reaching out to the community and serving uh, education for physicians and patients in the community. Uh, the other, obviously, is the Carmanus Cancer Center in Detroit, uh, but Michigan's had a cancer center, as I'll highlight in, in a few slides, since the late 1980s, a comprehensive cancer center since 1991. The, there are in other networks and other consortiums of cancer center. The University of Michigan's been a pioneer in this area as well with other institutions. What's highlighted on this map are national comprehensive cancer center networks. And if any of you are counting carefully, you'll notice that my slide uh, w doesn't match exactly. It's got 21. There are now 25 uh, centers uh, that are NCCN centers. Sam Silver at our institution is assistant dean for research and associate medical director in the FGP's chairman of the NCCN board of directors and has uh, a major leadership role as well as others from the University of Michigan Cancer Center. The goal of this network is to ensure delivery of high quality cost-effective services to people with cancer across the country uh, and to study outcomes. There are, in fact, if you do a Google search, uh, which I was prone to do for this talk, uh, you find lots of hits for Cancer Center in Michigan, and many of these are, are not cancer centers that are comprehensive cancer centers or academic medical centers at all. The University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center is obviously fairly far up the list because of its links and, and various other issues. Uh, but in fact, many cancer centers exist in the state of Michigan. So what distinguishes a successful academic cancer center, an NCI comprehensive cancer center, from cancer centers around the state uh, and in the region? Uh, this is actually something that I turn to for, from Joe Simone, who's been a longtime advisor to many cancer centers, including the University of Michigan, and is, is quite a sage, at least in, in my opinion, in many things related to cancer and academic medicine. Some of you may have read uh, Joe's, Joe's very useful article, Simone's Maxims, and when you're feeling badly about yourself and how your institution treats you, Joe would point out that your institution doesn't love you back and many other <laughs> useful things. So, uh, so I would highlight that as a, as a useful piece of reading for those days you're not feeling quite so good about things. But Joe put this out in 2002, and I think it's still exceptionally useful for understanding academic cancer centers, some of their strengths and some of their weaknesses and the complexity. So, uh, he highlighted the notion for clear vision and goals, integrated multi multidisciplinary research activities that would span the continuum from prevention to end-of-life care, including in underserved populations, 
uh, activities that would be bridging between laboratory, translational, and clinical, uh, multidisciplinary clinical programs providing top-notch care and engaged in clinical research, routine use and development of evidence-based standards of care, effective processes and mechanisms for constructive debate across the cancer center, transparency of practices, oversight, and operations, coordination and integration of education and clinical and research training, long before, as many of you know, the NCI has determined this is an important feature of NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers, a slate of engaging uh, and well-attended meetings, seminars, workshops for staff and faculty, and processes for continuously understanding, managing, and controlling cancer better. The University of Michigan has been fortunate enough uh, since the Regents in 1986 approved the University of Michigan Comprehensive, uh, University of Michigan Cancer Center, and Max Wish is the initial director. Ray Rudden is here in the audience. Max and Ray are, I think, credited in, in, in all ways and all appropriately for founding the Cancer Center back in the mid-1980s. And Max has led the Cancer Center uh, throughout its, its, its period and been exceptionally successful. And I'd like to highlight uh, many of the strengths at the University of Michigan, uh, which I think are strengths that we should continue to build on. So uh, it obviously, as, as Dr. Simone pointed out, has a clear-cut vision. It's committed to the conquest of cancer through innovation and collaboration, and it has very stated and, and focused goals to be a national leader in research, a preferred cancer provider, and a trainer of future leaders in cancer research. So I think all of those are consistent with the kind of vision that, that I would like to, if I were selected as director, continue to emphasize. There's been major growth in clinical activity in the Cancer Center building, from 1998, it opened in 1997, uh, to 2013, and that's what's illustrated here in, in number of patient activity uh, measures here by infusion, B2 procedures, and patient support services, et cetera, and patient visits. So you can see a group from, for those in the back, from roughly 58, 60,000 in 1998 over here on the left, all the way to roughly 150,000 or so uh, visits and, and uh, procedures for patients. There's been substantial growth and, and maintenance of that dominant position in the state for the University of Michigan health system in inpatient care in Michigan, uh, not indicated in maize and blue, indicated in a, a non-Michigan blue color at the top of the slide uh, that I didn't recolor is the University of Michigan health system and the inpatient cancer market share relative to other hospitals in the state. This precipitous drop-off, which I believe isn't, isn't well labeled here, is DMC uh, and, and the Detroit Medical Center is due to the growth and the opening of Carmona's Cancer Center. Uh, in 2003. But you can see that, that through, through 2012 and perhaps even into 2013, there's very strong dominance by the University of Michigan in the inpatient cancer market. And one of the other issues that, that's been a growing, uh, it's been a familiar one to, to units like radiation oncology, but to many units in the cancer center is the engagement of, of other units and affiliates, uh, other academic centers around the state. This is an example from the radiation oncology website that highlights the radiation oncology present presence at, at many other institutions and uh, interactions across the state, which is probably, a, again, a growing example for the Cancer Center uh, over the next period of time. The brief history of the center in a high-level view, as I'd indicated, the Cancer Center support grant first funded in 1988 with five subsequent renewals. The 2012 data indicate that we were clearly a leading center nationally, fourth-ranked institution in NCI funding. Uh, as all of all cancer centers were to the top ranked medical school in NCI funding in 2012. More than 350 cancer center members, they're from nine of the UM 17 schools, 36 different departments represented, have strong interactions with a number of other University of Michigan institutes, including the Life Sciences Institute, Institute for Social Research, and the Institute for Health Policy and Innovation, and their extensive collaborations with many other UM centers. I just highlighted a few here. Organogenesis under Gary Hammer's leadership, MCTP, uh, CDMN under the leadership of uh, Rick Newbig and, and David Sherman, and, and now the, the LSI, uh, and the Depression Center as well. It's been a longstanding three-divisional research structure uh, with a major emphasis on translational and multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research, and the number of uh, cancer center support grant programs and the total number of programs is highlighted here with directors in each of these areas and a director, Moshe Talpas, for translational research directors of, of uh, clinical research, Ma Hussain, and a to-be-named director in the population research area. So just by way of perspective, it's use, useful to reflect back with the center uh, founding in 1988, this, the growth of NCI funding to the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Cancer Center has really been quite extraordinary over the, the, 
the 1990 and early 2000 period and only begun now to level off as NIH funding in general and NCI fundings become considerably flatter uh, for invest individual investigator grants. Another issue is if you ask somebody uh, as they were traveling across campus for directions to the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center, you'd have some challenge if they actually knew a good deal about the cancer center and the institution. So I would not be prone if they asked that question to give them the straightest of answer. If they were asking for directions to the cancer center building, that's a really clear cut uh, point. That's illustrated here. But what this map of Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan campus just gives you a sense of the scale and breadth of the University of Michigan as a research university and the strengths that we take advantage of. Illustrated over here, the North Campus Research Complex. Illustrated here, the engineering school, the medical school, and the health system illustrated here, the School of Public Health, uh, nursing school, and the North Ingalls building, and so forth, all the way over to the Institute for Social Research. So the campus and the scale and scope of research at the University of Michigan is, is perhaps as broad and as extraordinary as it is at any a matrix cancer center around the country and any cancer center. So it's really challenging to highlight some of the research strengths, but I think they're worth highlighting because the research strength that we would probably hope to build on over the next decade or so, as I think most of these are really timely and important topics for the cancer field, not only at the University of Michigan, but nationally and internationally. So we have uh, strengths, a number of strengths in early phase clinical trials for selected cancers, targets, and concepts. There's considerable resources and interest in chemo prevention, ranging from dietary and small molecule approaches to even biological agents and microbial interventions. It's extraordinary research in quality of care in diverse patient populations, research on disparities in access to and quality of cancer care, novel approaches in tailored messaging begun by Vic Strecker and carried forward now by Larry Ann and others, cancer communications, including connecting with and monitoring cancer patients at distant site, and also cancer survivorship and effects and consequences of therapy and quality of life, as I've highlighted from the CANSORT initiative led by Stephen Katz and his colleagues. Cancer genetics and epigenetics discovery efforts are really extraordinary here. Uh, Arul Janayan and the work of others in the cancer genetics field and the colleagues that Jay Hess was able to recruit and build up in pathology are really extraordinary in cancer epigenetics among other units. Cancer signaling defects, a prominent area of research in our institution. Molecular and genomic approaches for early detection, disease monitoring, and therapy selection. And I'll return to this as a theme that I think has particular traction going forward. Uh, novel reagents, platform methods for refining prognosis and, and patient stratification, mouse models of cancer, cancer stem cells and the signaling pathways. The University of Michigan's arguably been one of the innovators and leaders in cancer initiating cells and concepts around their treatment, work led by Michael Clark when he was here at the University of Michigan, Max Wish, uh, Sean Morrison, and then developed by many others in many of the organ-based programs. So the last area, just to highlight, not to give short shrift to any, and undoubtedly I have and will offend some by leaving their, their work out or their area of science, but there's enormous potential, I believe, here at Michigan and has been substantial advances in molecular and functional imaging. There's powerful work taking place in DNA damage response and strategies for therapeutic targeting, discovery and development of novel small molecules. Xiaoming Wang is a pioneer in this area and others at the institution, Doreen Namadi and others have been recruited. Cancer stromal and cancer immune cell interactions, host microbe interactions, inflammation in cancer, and then circulating cancer cells. So again, this is a very quick list of, of many exciting areas of research that probably deserve their own seminar or own coverage, so I won't cover them in any depth, but I, I'll just turn to a few areas that I think have particular prominence and traction and highlight not only the opportunities, but some of the challenges for the future. I'll do that after I just tell you a little bit more about the Cancer Center's current strengths, and one of them is in education and training. Uh, we have a cancer biology training program that's existed for roughly 20 years now. The director of that for a long period of time has been Michael Imperiali, who's led that very su successfully. It trains exceptional PhD or MD postgraduate candidates for addressing fundamental questions in ca human cancer. We have an exceptional cancer biology program now that I think is in its fourth full year. It's graduated its first graduate from Tom Carey's lab of the program. The director of that's Michael Imperiali and the associate director is Colin Duckett. Uh, it's focused on, on, on graduate uh, education in the cancer biology area and is a member of the PIBS uh, consortium of programs. We have multiple NIH and NCI training grants for postgraduate training and we host in fact a cancer research program. It's a bit of a pipeline program to develop new cadres of, of individuals and investigators at the undergraduate level who pursue careers in, in cancer research. So opportunities and challenges. So 
This isn't my rear view mirror, but it's a, an old fo photo of my side view mirror. Uh, and one of these things, you back out of your driveway every day and, and you see this mirror. And most of the days you don't see uh, objects in the mirror at all. You just see these trees and things at a distance. But uh, when you're thinking about this talk, you begin to envision objects in your mirror. So this is just a highlight of some of the opportunities uh, and diverse and enormous opportunities in the cancer research field. So I think it's impossible to, to highlight ex the extraordinary progress that's been made in developing uh, technologies, concepts, agents, uh, and, and approaches for actually not only understanding the origins of cancer and cancer progression, but to actually make a significant impact on patient populations with often many techniques that weren't, were certainly unknown at the time when I was a graduate and medical student, and certainly some of these techniques and technologies and, and ideas have really only been uncovered in the past decade. So I'm not going to cover any of these because it would take considerable time to cover each of them in their own right, but just highlight a few of these that I might touch on later. Uh, Immune-based therapies and immunomodulatory therapies, uh, tumor uh, molecularly informed therapy decisions I'll touch on in a second, stem cell biology and so forth. So I think the, the challenge is not only understanding uh, the opportunities, but trying to, to, to understand the challenges in the cancer research field and trying to see how the, the opportunities almost always exceed the challenges, bearing in mind that on any given day, one can see some problems in almost any area uh, and, and feel like they're, uh, they're, they're dwarfing your positive outlook on things. So again, not to leave you with with too much, but I think uh, many in the room would, would agree that regulatory and reporting requirements are, are tremendous uh, challenges for cancer research and, and clinical cancer research and cancer care, flat NIH funding, resource intensive research, finding good mentors, and, and many of these other issues are, are major challenges, I think, uh, for us at the present and the future. There are also major challenges in clinical care that are already here and more on the horizon. Maybe most of these challenges aren't going to show up on the slide, which will be an issue. But again, uh, there was, in fact, there were some other ones uh, highlighted here about, oh, there, I guess I have to click them all. So they won't go automatically. So this just highlights some of the many challenges in, in clinical care that many of you in the room are far more familiar with than I am, as I uh, didn't train beyond medical school as a physician. So uh, I haven't dealt with these problems, but I've heard uh, bits and pieces of them and have some sense of the, their very significant impact as we go forward as a cancer center and a community of cancer programs at the University of Michigan. So I'd like to focus more on opportunities, as I said, than on challenges and just tell you a little bit about how I think that the enormous progress at this institution and around the country and around the world in elucidating the genetic and epigenetic defects in cancer is going to impact to some greater or lesser degree on, an, on most every cancer type that we're interested in, in treating uh, and just highlight some of those. What's illustrated over on the right-hand slide is a slide, uh, a graph from this Vogelstein review from Science in 2013 that highlights schematically some of the various cancers that have been very extensively studied by sequencing-based approaches. And then it highlights the average number or the median number of mutations found in each of these cancer types. And then that's sort of further hammered home down here with mutagen-induced cancers due to tobacco smoke or UV light in the case of melanoma, having enormous numbers of mutations per base pair non-synonymous non changes. Other cancers of various types illustrated here with de decreasing number of mutations. Liquid tumors generally fewer mutations and pediatric tumors even fewer mutations still. Partly based on the view that many of the cells that give rise to cancer have already accumulated many potential passenger mutations when the transforming genetic events arise. So there's been dramatic progress and continues to be in cataloging, cataloging these genetic and epigenetic defects. There's enormous diversity in mutation number and the specific genes affected from one cancer to another. The, the, some of the themes are the gene lesions often target highly conserved signaling pathways and cell fate determination pathways. The somatic mutations in a given patient's cancers have shared features with other cancers of that type and other cancers in general, but many, many unique features compared to patients with that cancer type. There's significant diagnostic and therapeutic implications and opportunities, and that's one of the areas that we're already uh, working on at this institution, and I suspect there'll be greater emphasis, continue to work on that going forward. The basis for this goes back, I think, at least to the time uh, of the under understanding of the basis for chronic myelogenous leukemia, initially worked by Janet Rowley and, 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 and Pete, uh, 
from space. Peter Knoll, who uncovered the, the, the first discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, and then Janet Rowley for determining the bands involved, uh, and then the work to identify the specific genes involved, uh, leading to work by Brian Drucker and, and others at the Dana-Farber, and then Brian Drucker at, at Oregon, uh, in co collaboration with Charles Sawyers and Moshe Talpaz and others around the country, to demonstrate that, in fact, with a sp very specific inhibitor of the ABLE kinase, you could see dramatic cytogenetic and therapeutic responses in patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia. So I think this is a, perhaps the dawn in some ways, of the, or at least the resurgence in some ways, of molecularly informed therapies for cancer and, and illustrating the potential of these therapies for substantial clinical benefit. There's been the coining of a new term. I'm not exactly sure it was needed, and it's somewhat uh, perhaps likely to offend many who were carrying out and continue to carry out precision medicine in many sh ways, shape, or form, but it's one that's, that's gaining, I guess, traction in, in some quarters. Uh, and if you do a search for it, you begin to find large numbers of papers in the past few years where precision medicine in cancer is being carried out. Uh, it seems as though this is a, a really exciting uh, way to think about molecularly informed therapies, but again, perhaps the term and has a lot of baggage associated with it. And again, uh, it's a pace perhaps of, of overpromise, at least in the initial stages, and underdeliver. So I think there are some challenges to near-term successes, and I'll just highlight these scheme, uh, as a list here and then show you two examples. One of the points is there's variable and often modest mutation frequency for any given gene in most common cancer types. The other data are that many common cancers have multiple driver gene lesions, and it's unclear whether targeting any one lesion will have dramatic clinical effect. There are a limited number of drugs available to target relevant gene lesions and pathways in cancer cells at the present, although more are forthcoming almost all the time. And two points that I want to highlight schematically are that many gene lesions in cancer are actually loss of function defects in tumor suppressor genes, not gain of function, and it raises significant questions about how you're going to target the potential consequence of many genes being dysregulated as the result of one loss of function mutation or loss of function mutations of both alleles. And an even more enormous problem is the biological and genetic and epigenetic heterogeneity in primary cancers and metastases with many possible routes to tumor progression and drug resistance. The slide highlighting the multiple uh, events and the notion of tumor suppressors playing particularly prominent roles as more events are acquired is illustrated here. And again, this slide from the Vogelstein review article on cancer genome landscapes, with the number of cancers having just one mutation or zero mutations indicated over on this, the side here, and then increasing numbers of, of molecular events found in many common cancers, colon and breast, glioblastoma and pancreas is just some examples. And many of those defects are loss of function mutations. For instance, in pancreas cancer, defects in the SMAD4 tumor suppressor, the P16 INC4A tumor suppressor, and P53 are very prominent along with RAS mutation. So again, raising some questions about the likelihood with, of achieving success with just targeting one pathway. Another major challenge to achieving success by targeting these specific genetic driver lesions, as they're often referred to, is the view that many cancers may have a clonal origin at the outset, but undergo considerable divergence even early in their growth and, and outgrowth. And that's what's highlighted here, the notion that there are multiple different subclonal populations in almost every primary tumor illustrated here in the case of a primary pancreas cancer. These subclones can give rise to clonal, perhaps, populations or even polyclonal populations of metastasis, and these clones can undergo significant clonal diversity as well. So again, it raises considerable challenges for thinking about targeting specific actionable mutations in and of their own right, unless they're early events that are shared by all of the clones in the, in the cancer uh, that are present in the patient. I do think there's enormous potential even at the present and in the near term, though, for using these molecular signatures of cancers and the specific driver gene and passenger gene alterations that are present to understand issues around tumor progression and recurrence, monitoring for minimal residual disease, as has been done so successfully in the hematologic malignancies at this institution and elsewhere, uh, and doing this perhaps in what's referred to as liquid tumor biopsies, where cell-free derived DNA uh, present and shed present in the patient's peripheral blood shed from the cancer cells might be interrogated for the mutations present. This is a paper from just a few years ago highlighting this strategy for a patient with ovarian cancer, uh, where the ovarian cancer recurrence was found to have acquired an EGF receptor mutation that wasn't present in the primary tumors initially resected. It was present in an omental mass that was resected at the time the patient underwent surgery. Another example of a patient with multiple primary cancers, in this case, a bowel primary tumor as well as an ovarian cancer, 
and what was uh, found was that the recurrence in this case collected at relapse had the signature of the ovarian cancer with the p53 mutation so again these are potential strategies that could play out in the not too distant future and I think are areas that are already uh, under keen attention here at the University of Michigan for these kind of approaches and others for monitoring the signatures of cancer cells and, and using that information to inform prognosis and, and decision about therapy. Another area I think of considerable excitement is the notion perhaps in certain populations, potentially high risk populations and maybe ultimately in the larger population or at least segments of it, carrying out analysis of DNA and in individuals who are asymptomatic. This was highlighted in a paper published as well in Science Translational Medicine in 2013 where they uh, evaluated DNA present in, in uh, thin prep pap smear tests for the mutations that were present in the patient's endometrial cancer or even the patient's uh, ovarian cancer and they were able to see that 100% of the endometrial cancers they could detect those mutations at variable frequency in, the, in prior pap smear specimens and even in a significant subset of the patients with ovarian cancer, they could pick these up. They developed a multiplex panel for the gene regions that were commonly mutated and showed that that had a considerable uh, value for potentially picking up endometrial and ovarian cancer cases, although obviously much larger cohorts than the ones they studied and, and much more rigorously controlled uh, in terms of the patients that are, that are put into these cohorts need to be pursued. But again, I think it just highlights one of the amazing opportunities. One of the other areas perhaps that could be combined is the use of these kind of molecular signatures and, and screening based approaches in certain populations to impact on cancer prevention and early detection. I'll just highlight what's obvious to most of you that we perhaps know as is highlighted in this Graham Kolditz article in Science Translational Medicine that upwards of about half of all cancers are due to lifestyle, dietary, and environmental exposures, and we could have a substantial impact on cancer incidence by attacking these kind of issues with, with more robust cancer prevention, cancer control uh, approaches, cancer communication strategies. So again, I think it's exceedingly important. Just to, to reiterate a point, again, familiar to most of you, and perhaps this curve isn't exactly, the Surgeon General Report, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary uh, on smoking and lung cancer and the, all of the data supporting the connection uh, provided in 1964 and you can see only more recently a roughly a 20-year lag do we, as smoking uh, decreases in the population do we begin to see this drop in male lung cancer deaths and perhaps the beginning of a drop in female lung cancer deaths. So smoking uh, is among the top issues. Graham Coldis says about a third of cancer is preventable by, by tobacco control or, or smoking cessation. So again one might hope for that. Obesity is another area that he highlights, and this is a slide, again, familiar to many of you, but from the American Cancer Society, just highlighting the growth in obesity in the population and its potential long-term ramifications for cancer incidence and poor cancer outcomes as well. So again, two of the major uh, environmental uh, observations. So I was in Baltimore, as uh, Dean Wollescroft highlighted, for about 13 years, and you can't go around Baltimore without finding some H.L. Mencken quotes of, of, of various kinds. And this is one that, that I think is, is apt because it's often true. I think it was used in the, in the Clinton uh, trial as, or the Clinton uh, defense in, in Congress as well by uh, one of the people who spoke on, on Clinton's behalf. So prior models for academic medical center, one of the, the, the clear-cut views over the, the, and Dean Wollescroft highlighted in his overview I think a year ago, was that the clinical margin at, at academic medical centers historically has helped to facilitate and support research and education missions. And I just tried to illustrate this to some extent with the clinical activity and clinical margin not only providing important and, and critical re research opportunities and, and clinical care for the, the patients served and, and the population served, but actually providing a very stimulatory role in driving the educational and research missions. So clearly intertwined, but in general and in the recent past, like many other academic medical centers, been modest to, moderate, modest to moderate margins to reinvest in research and education, and that will likely be a major challenge going forward. So it leads me to highlight one of the other challenges. This, for those who can't read at the back, I crossed out the world and wrote NIH funding. For those who were NIH funded in the early 1990s, NIH funding was an extreme challenge for a roughly three to four year period in the early 1990s, and then grew very substantially in the mid and late 1990s and 2000. With, with very substantial growth. So this is a slide that sort of highlights that, that maybe we're back in a protracted period of NIH funding being limited. I certainly don't think it's coming to an end again. What, what's illustrated in this slide, and I won't go through all the columns, is that there has been 
very substantial decreases in almost all aspects of NIH and NCI funding since 2003, when NIH funding was probably at its most robust per investigator and so forth. If you look at some of the aspects with regard to 1995, perhaps a more common period in NIH funding, uh, the number of R01 equivalent awards is down because the NIH is investing in a number of other scientific opportunities, and the success rates are down because the number of grants is very high. But some of the other aspects of NIH funding and so forth, even using 1995 dollars, are really pretty robust. So I'm not suggesting that times are good or anything like that, but per perhaps times are with hopeful uh, view could be headed back towards uh, the, a more promising view, and I'll, I'll turn to that. This is another Mencken quote that I particularly like, because I, at least I find it true, other people may not, uh, that for every complex problem that we encounter in almost every area, with the quick, we like to sort of come to one or two or three ideas that are going to be solutions. And, and for the NIH funding problem and the decreasing clinical margin for academic medical centers, I don't think there are any simple uh, solutions that are actually correct. So I think there are real problems that are with us and we need to grapple with them and think about them as an academic medical center and a cancer center. I think there are major changes in NIH and other federally funded research already underway. They'll continue. I would highlight this paper that came out. Many of you saw it already. A paper, an opinion piece, perspective piece from Bruce Alberts, Mark Kirshner, Shirley Tillman, and Harold Varmus, some major leaders in biology and medicine that highlight uh, some of the major issues in biomedical research and, and, and point us towards a plan to get back towards more stable and predictable funding, better alignment of expectations with the, the, the real world uh, realities going forward, uh, grant making that actually is likely to improve productivity or at least some attempts at that, and addressing some policies that undermine stability, some of which aren't perhaps so favorable for academic medical centers, but I won't talk about those. The one thing I will say that there are other data that would suggest that we need to work uh, in, in a really concerted fashion to well align what we do in the clinical sphere, in the research sphere, and in the educational sphere. And this is my attempt to, to conceptualize the Victor Zaum artic article, at least what I took away from it, with the prior models being that these could be largely or almost entirely independent activities, clinical activity obviously benefiting. Uh, in, in many, many ways, research and educational opportunities in an institution, but perhaps not the need to have them so intricately linked. But the current and future state is I think they need to be as maximally overlined in many areas as possible to best take advantage of, of our opportunities here uh, to advance research through discoveries, to educate the next generation of scientists and physicians and physician and scientist leaders, and to maximize our opportunities to be successful as academic uh, clinical centers and, and preferred uh, r referral sites and, and destination sites for our patients. Well, the last thing I'll say about biomedical research funding from extramural sources is, in fact, that there's growing emphasis at this institution and others around the country on industrial or pharmaceutical or other based funding from, from, from industry, and that's what's highlighted here. I apologize for citing a, a Boston Globe article, but uh, I thought it was one of the useful ones for at least highlighting this concept, so I won't atone to the accuracy of it, uh, but it wasn't retracted, I would say. So uh, the, this just highlights the relative trends. You can see we're on par with Johns Hopkins in terms of industry-sponsored funding. I would say that Hopkins has considerably more total funding than we do, so this is a larger funding there. But peer institutions, including some cancer centers, freestanding cancer centers, are arg arguably obviously ahead of us. The last thing I'd say about funding is that there's obviously been a recognition at this institution, there'll be an increasing recognition in the, the important driving effect in this a complicated scheme of the institutional mission being driven forward by these intermeshed uh, activities of clinical activity, uh, research activity, educational activity, service and outreach, and also philanthropy at the institution playing a particularly driving role in sustaining uh, the education and research missions and also perhaps even service and outreach. So what's the future state of the U of M cancer program? So I've highlighted many areas of strength already and many of the exceptional things that I think make Michigan a, a truly wonderful place, uh, led over the past 25 years in the Cancer Center by Max Wisher, but my many senior uh, leaders at the institution in various departments who've played absolutely critical roles in helping to build and sustain the Cancer Center. But these are just some of the, the, I think, the goals of the future state in the next five to ten years that we hope to continue to achieve uh, or to perhaps achieve if we're not already doing so. We want to be a leading provider of exceptional quality and highest value cancer care in Michigan and the Midwest. We want to be nationally and internationally respected as a premier institution for cancer care in selected areas. 
a major fraction of cancer patients here enrolled in clinical trials, interventional or observational, and U of M faculty viewed as major clinical thought leaders and pioneers in changing practice. Obviously, many of these points in the top already exist, but I think they need to be reinforced continually to maintain success and, and to keep our momentum. We, we already, as I highlighted, were top four for NCI Cancer Center in 2012 in the top medical school, and I think then it's a reasonable goal to state that this is where we'd like to be going forward. We'd like to be a national leader in cancer invention disclosures, patents, licensing, and spin-off companies, and I think because of the, the positive effects these can have on taking our discoveries to the clinic and actually impacting on patient care. Top metrics for discovery should not only include grant dollars, obviously they're really important because that's how research gets done with, in fact, dollars to support it, but we want to have high impact publications on original discoveries and our clinical and research faculty receiving honors and national recognition for their work and accomplishments. We want to continue to be a leading institution for graduate and postgraduate cancer education and training and a major national pipeline for trainees and faculty for other top tier cancer institutions. The preferred cancer referral site in Michigan and the Midwest, as I showed you, the UMH inpatient data would indicate that we're already a preferred inpatient cancer care facility and we want to continue that excellence. We want to be an innovator that actually improves the cancer prevention, early detection and treatment for the citizens of Michigan and they can in fact perhaps greater feel our impact. And I believe we also obviously want to be, if we want to be successful in all these others, a top rated, diverse and inclusive work environment for all of our staff, faculty and trainees. Uh, obviously, the plan of attack to, to maintain our successes has is, is got considerable depth beneath this, and, and I won't talk in, in too much depth other than to have one more slide about cross-cutting programs, but I think part of the, the, the ability to continue to maintain our success and build on it depends on values and culture for our patients, for staff, and faculty. I think they need to feel satisfied and feel that the working and, and being a patient at the University of Michigan and being a faculty member at the University of Michigan are all exceptionally meaningful experiences. So the, the care for our patients, patient-centric, clear-cut integrity, quality, safety, service, and compassion, our staff and, and faculty, respect, diversity, passion, transparency, innovation, and teamwork, and above all else, I really think discovery is the key word that should define what we do going forward in all of our activities as we try and advance an impact on cancer care. So th how would we get there? I think we're already achieving many of the things, but I think we need to renew our efforts and broadly engage the staff, the faculty, trainees, and, and U of M leadership in many units, not only at the medical school, but around the university in strategic planning and, and carrying out uh, what we're already engaged in and building new visions for the future. Uh, I'll highlight just a few clinical and research opportunities that I think are cross-cutting. We need, I think, most of all to provide support for people, programs, and innovative new directions diversify our funding base and substantially strengthen philanthropy, and uh, not unexpectedly, we should regularly assess and report on our progress and readjust our course as needed to, to continue to have success. Some cross-cutting themes that I just highlighted, again, these are uh, sort of the fair and centric view of the world, so I apologize for that, and they may be shared with some people here. There are already areas that we've invested in considerably, and I think there's further opportunities for further investment. There's enormous interest in understanding cancer metabolism, and the metabolic effects of cancer on the body. There are also major interests in understanding the connections between obesity and increased risk of cancer. So an obvious area to build on strengths at this institution with the metabolomics efforts of Chuck Barant and others uh, and our strengths in cancer. Tumor microenvironment and implications for therapy as well as uh, tumor resistant and local and metastatic disease. Clearly a major sequelae in, in certain uh, diseases, prostate cancer are outside the prostate, and I think they're just one of many examples of truly trying to understand the tumor microenvironment. Other work on, on stromal cells and, and their role in containing or restraining or enhancing cancer at different sites is, is work that's just been highlighted recently by Andy Rim's work in cancer cell. Stem cell biology, an important area obviously now and going forward, not only cancer stem cells, but hematopoietic stem, stem cells, modifications to those cells and transplantation. So exciting work from Judy Leopold, uh, Xiaoming Wang, Tomek Chapecki, Jolanta Grumbeka, and many others in experimental therapeutics and early stage clinical trials, tumor immunology and immunotherapy. Again, uh, very exciting and out outstanding work here in our tumor immunology uh, and host response program from Weiping Zhu and others. Microbes, inflammation, and cancer are really a hot area in internationally, and I think it builds on our fast forward initiatives in microbes. Uh, single cell analysis, there's excitement not only about this as a platform, but for thinking about 
how to use it to understand biological heterogeneity in the patient and predictions of response. But enormous strengths now in in vivo imaging that are even building further with really novel approaches for picking up premalignant lesions in various sites with a fluorescent endoscopy-based approaches from Tom Wang and his colleagues at the engineering school, uh, and novel therapeutic delivery approaches. So I've given you uh, lots of, of things that I'm excited about, but I think at the end of the day, the, the cancer center director really tries to lead and advocate on behalf of those here at the institution, because the, the folks at the institution have unbelievable numbers of really uh, exciting and innovative ideas, and it's really the cancer center director and the cancer center leadership uh, that needs to help those individuals have the success working either individually or hopefully more often as teams in interdisciplinary ways to, to build the future of cancer care at the University of Michigan through discoveries. So I uh, probably went oh, just about on time, uh, a hair over, uh, and uh, we'll take questions. So thank you. Hi, Larry. Yes, Eric. Thank you. In the past, you haven't been involved clinically and down in the trenches. Do you envision a change in that behavior? And if not, how are you going to structure leadership sure. to meet uh, patient issues? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Larry. So uh, as most of you know, I trained as an MD-PhD student at Johns Hopkins, but didn't continue any training after medical school. So I have, as I like to tell Dr. Carruthers, no skills in the clinic that it could be of any use to the department. That said, I, I really have strong interest in clinical medicine and, and seeing that we're effective in uh, managing, preventing, controlling cancer, and, and taking uh, excellent care, exceptional care of cancer survivors. So I would envision uh, participating fully in activities to evaluate and strategically plan in that area, but would envision continuing to build a, a team, which we have, I think, an exceptional team already, additional colleagues is needed to be uh, ever more successful in, in overseeing the clinical activities, not only in the cancer center's ambulatory care unit and in the hospital, but in the many other clinical facilities that cancer care is carried out at the University of Michigan Health System and as we grow that with affiliates. So while I wouldn't have a direct role in, in overseeing any of those activities uh, individually, I would expect to play a significant role in, in regular uh, receives a, uh, receiving a reporting visiting those facilities, chatting with the staff and faculty colleagues in those facilities, and working with uh, another senior leader in the cancer center or other senior leaders to be very effective. I'd also envision working very closely with the clinical chairs to be effective uh, in, in aiding them as they try and be even, even more successful than they are now in pursuing the, the highest quality clinical care at the University of Michigan for the cancer programs. Right. right. Sure, so thanks, Ray. Um, so as you know well, because you were a pharmacology chair here at the University of Michigan and a, a founder of the Cancer Center and then a leader of the Epley Cancer Center at, at Nebraska and are, are keen to know that the Cancer Center is, is obviously uh, integrated as a matrix center into the fabric already, I think, of basic science, clinical science, translational research at the university. And I would envision the Cancer Center uh, and the leadership of the Cancer Center reviewing, reading very carefully, thinking critically about the report that, that Gil led us on uh, and Connie Bridges so ably supported with her, her colleagues in the dean's office, uh, that describes a number of actions that can and perhaps should be taken to improve the basic science, not only in the basic science departments but across the medical school and to build greater interactions across the university between the medical school and LSNA, College of Pharmacy and other component units of the, of the institution pursuing basic research. So uh, I think basic research at the, at the end of the day is, is foundational research. I think it's fundamental uh, to make discoveries and to think about how to apply them to improve hum, human health. So I think the Cancer Center would continue to be a strong supporter of foundational research and, and efforts to, to translate that. I think we would work, obviously, hopefully, as we've continued to do with all of the partner units to build strengths as, as they fit with the Cancer Center's mission and needs and with the partner unit's missions and needs. So 
Obviously, with regard to appointments, we don't make appointments and tenures, so some of the recommendations around that aren't, aren't so relevant to us. But I think most of the recommendations about building science, building team science, other than the recommendations about the BRAIN initiative, which is obviously relevant to cancer, but perhaps a, a little less relevant to cancer in the immediate term, uh, I think apply to the cancer center. So we would hope to be uh, great uh, participants, great stewards of resources that were provided to build uh, efforts in this area and, and work as I think uh, Max and the Cancer Center have historically and continue to with all of the requisite partner units to strengthen basic science research and to build real bridges between the basic science departments uh, and the clinical colleagues in the clinical departments. Motion. Yeah, yeah, so Moshe's question was, uh, I was going to pretend I didn't hear it, but uh, <laughs> I'll answer it anyway. So Moshe's question was, the University of Michigan's ranking has uh, declined a bit in the U.S. News and World Report. Is that important? And what action should we take to improve our ranking? Uh, that pretty much everything? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're absolutely correct. The University of Michigan as a health system has, I don't know the numbers, um, I try and forget those kind of things. I remember only the positive things. Uh, so it has gone down. Uh, it has gone down in some areas more than others. I think it's worth taking a hard look at that. The, the rankings are, as best I understand it, which isn't very well, arrived at but relatively complicated formulas that only a little bit include reputational ranking. There are many other things they rank and they change a bit from year to year. So uh, I think there, there's, there are groups here at the University of Michigan, I believe, focused uh, on addressing those issues and making real change. I do think it matters uh, that, we're, that we're positively perceived by the individuals who assess our, our, uh, some of the metrics that go into U.S. News and World Report, and I do think it's very important that we're positively received by uh, physicians in the state of Michigan, in the Midwest, and around the country, and around the world. And I think we are in many ways. Perhaps they're not registered with the sort of tell us the top five institutions you'd refer, independent of resources and distance. Uh, but I think making discoveries and having thought leaders and having exceptional clinical care and exceptional responsiveness in the clinical care delivery for patients and, and physicians who refer patients to us are probably among the issues that might be addressable to change some of these, these rankings. I think there are only some of the other rankings. I think there are other rankings for the University of Michigan clinical care that have gone in the other directions, and, and the dean could highlight those, or Doug Strong or others could highlight those. So I think it's only one of a number of rankings, uh, but it, it's definitely important to pay attention to these because I think they, they do play important roles in, in the patients seeking us out from a, a distance and from the state and for physicians who think of the University of Michigan. We'd like to think of them, uh, have, a, have them think of us in the absolute forefront of institutions nationally. Well, I, I certainly can't and won't speak with authority to uh, what, it, I think it goes back to the H.L. Mencken quote, uh, for every complex uh, problem, there's an a, a easy answer that's a, a simple and wrong, uh, because it's, I think, a complicated uh, story. That you're absolutely correct that accruals to therapeutic interventional trials have declined a bit over the past, I don't know, three, three to four years or something like that, if we looked at the data. I think it's, it represents changes nationally and internationally in the, na in the trial landscape with the availability of, of agents. The NCI used to have quite a robust pipeline of agents and certainly has less of a robust uh, pipeline now of agents. Uh, so I think that's one of the issues. I think the complexities in the trial are one of the issues. I think we've had some issues at our own institution about uh, time to trial activation that may be quite meaningful and, and challenges around those. Uh, regulatory and reporting, I think, are, are, are challenges, and I think there are probably a list of others, but it's obviously front and center in the minds of the Cancer Center leadership to address this issue because we'd like to advance not only laboratory discoveries, but to take those laboratory discoveries and make real impacts ultimately with 
colleagues here at Michigan and elsewhere to change practice. That obviously doesn't happen with every uh, new drug trial, but I think that's the goal of everybody working in the cancer center is to make discoveries that will advance cancer care, and I think that will continue in clinical trial research, obviously, whether it's interventional trials or observational trials, which are equally important in many ways, need to be supported, fostered, and, and to uh, uh, attack to try and find out how we can do more. Uh, so my sense is it's for real. Uh, I think others in the room would probably well agree with that view that there are dramatic activities in certain patient populations with certain agents and there are likely to be more on the immune modulatory front from immune checkpoint work that arose from Jim Allison and Li Ping Chang and others and carried forward by people like Susan Tapali and, and others around the country. <coughs> I think um, we used to be, have considerable activity and we still have some activity in the clinical tumor immunology, immunotherapy area, we have outstanding laboratory work from Weiping Zhu and others in basic tumor immunology and studying T cell subsets and, and their role as well as inflammation and, and cancer. So I think uh, we, it's one of the areas I, I highlighted or should have highlighted if I didn't, uh, that we have some strengths and I think we need to make considerable investments because I think it's a particularly promising area, maybe not in, on its own as a single therapy, but in combination with other existing agents. So I would expect that it'll be a, a really important area to continue to invest here at the University of Michigan and perhaps uh, one of the er top areas to invest in. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so it, it, Yeah, sure. So uh, it's, it's, I was a little perhaps cryptic, but my slides around the uh, molecular signatures of cancer circulating in some patients from some organ sites at certain stages, whether it's cell-free DNA as I highlighted, it's just the example I chose or it's exosomes, uh, as Manish Tiwari, who came recently to us from the Fred Hutchinson, or circulating single cells that we might be able to interrogate very shortly in all kinds of complexity at the protein level and understand their differences from one to another, or any of a number of those. I think uh, for cancers that we're having major challenges treating with current therapies and are likely to continue to have major challenges based on tumor burden, likelihood of resistance, genetic and biological heterogeneity. I think early detection strategies, whether it's in high-risk populations such as BRCA mutation carriers or whether it's even in the general population in the case of ovarian cancer or pancreas cancer for the whole population or genetically predisposed populations uh, that there are which many genes of germline mutation variants that are associated with risk, I think we really have to redouble our efforts. I think we have to be very critical about what we accept is proof that our screening approaches, our molecular markers, even if they're the signatures of cancer cells that we believe are driving it, are they really, in fact, sufficiently robust to do what we'd like them to do? Gil Oman and Dan Hayes led a biomarkers report on that that, that highlighted the challenges in that field. But I, I guess I don't view, as naive as perhaps that may sound, the signatures of cancer cell in the form of mutant DNA as the same kind of biomarkers that we have perhaps in the cancer field chased uh, historically. So I could be on a fool's errand, but I, I think those, they're really fundamentally different. They're at the heart of cancer if they're some of the mutations that drive it. Obviously, even if you find them, there's enormous work to figure out what to do, how to do it, how to, what's the temporal order of doing all that work, and that's where I think research, at least for some of those cancers, will play out over the next decade or, or perhaps longer, unfortunately. But I think early detection and early treatment when tumors are resectable 
in organs such as uh, ovarian cancer, often arising, as it turns out now, as my wife so often reminds me, in the uh, fallopian tube and not on the ovary itself in the case of ovarian cancer or in the pancreas duct, really I think will be uh, critical to having success in those diseases. On, on recruitment and the difficulty of, uh, of, of getting great people uh, to move, getting great people to come to the University of Michigan. Um, I've wondered a little bit about whether we have a local issue going on, uh, the, the view of what the state is like, um, you know, the challenges of moving west and east coast to the Midwest. Do you see opportunities for improving the way we are recruiting at the university that could optimize the kind of new national and international energy we need at this university? Uh, so I, I think the University of Michigan's had uh, quite extraordinary success in recruitment in many areas uh, of biomedical research from basic science to clinical and all. We could always have more. I think the competition is keen. It's exceptionally keen to bring the very best people to the university. It's exceptionally keen to retain the very best people at the University of Michigan. So we have to often re-recruit some of our colleagues here on a regular basis, but we, we enjoy that uh, and it's important. Uh, so I think we, we, we have to take note of both retentions and recruitments. So I think that there are enormous opportunities here at the University of Michigan as a research institution and the strengths that one can capitalize on that are really unique. I don't think there are many institutions, as my, Max was often great to highlight, where there were nine separate schools in the top ten in the country as they ranked graduate schools and professional schools for their scholarly activities and ranked by peers. So I think that's an exceptional opportunity. I do think we have to be focused on, on absolutely putting together the right collection of resources for the right people in the right departments. And I think we, as a cancer center, have to continually work closely with departments to try and understand their needs and desires and how that fits with the cancer center mission and, and make some compromises perhaps on both sides as we often have done. But I think we have exceptional opportunities. Uh, the, the Transforming Basic Science Report highlighted uh, the notion of revitalizing the Biological Sciences Scholars Program. The Cancer Center itself could re revitalize that in some ways for not only laboratory science, but for clinical scholars, clinical research scholars, uh, and for population scholars and health sciences scholars. So it doesn't need to be at the medical school and the university maybe be for laboratory scientists, but the Cancer Center, uh, perhaps if, if our resources allow and, and perhaps we should prioritize it to have a scholars program where we highlight recruitment of, of the most outstanding candidates, irrespective of discipline, just based on how exceptional they are. And we work together with our colleagues to do that. It was a, it was a great deal of fun. I had uh, playing a role in, in helping to lead the basic science chairs and, and selected clinical chairs and some representatives for other units in the biological scholars program. And so I think that that was an effective mechanism that took advantage of our, our opportunities across the institution. Uh, to do that, and I think the Cancer Center could, can and, and can, has done that and could continue to do that. Well, uh, given the time, I want to thank you, Eric, for sharing with us your vision and uh, answering a lot of questions. So thank you all. Enjoy the evening. Thank you.